So welcome everyone. My name is Kai and I am the communication coordinator for Idaho Partners for Good. And thank you so much for joining us today um, with our March Breakthrough Series. Mike um, has worked for Boise State University for the last nine years in the service learning program. And over that time, he has specialized in partnerships, community engagement, program management, curriculum and course design, data management and analysis, public speaking, event planning, and storytelling. So we are very grateful that he is joining us today. Um, some folks have asked, what is Uncorking University Innovation to increase your capacity? Well, if you've ever looked at having maybe student internships or partnering with the university and trying to figure out how do I partner or um, you know, how do I get student interns to come and work with me? How does research happen? This is the perfect session for you to come and learn a little bit more about that. So Mike, I am going to turn it over to you. Awesome, thanks Kai. Um, so yes, exactly how Kai set it up is what I'm hoping to kind of uh, help folks break down and understand how to engage with the university because it is quite a challenge. In my time that I've worked with community, I frequently hear from community partners, wait, wait, how does this work? Where do I go? Who shall I contact? Um, and unfortunately, sorry, spoiler alert, there's not, there's not a, a one key or one thing fits all. But hopefully uh, after today, I'll at least give you a couple ideas of maybe where to start and in and, and what, what ways should you engage those individuals. And I have a little bit of a model to share on how you can think about it. And it's really a cycle and it's something that changes um, over time. Um, okay, so a little bit about who I am. You heard a little uh, from the beginning here, um, but I'm a father, I'm a learner and educator, I'm a cyclist, I'm a naturalist, and a cryptozoologist. And if you don't know what that is, basically I love thinking about things like Sasquatch and Chupacabras and you name it, whatever crazy creature any culture or region has, I wanna know about it and I wanna to try to find it um, because I love investigating those types of things um, in the natural world. Um, and I feel like you have to be a believer um, in those things. So um, yeah, uh, I, I, I like to ideate and analyze different situations. Learning is obviously a, a tenant of, of my being. Uh, and context is so important to me and, and adapting, being flexible in that. And these are things that I hope to kind of bring to, uh, to today's talk, as well as you know where I'm coming from, the perspective I bring to this. And one of the, the things that I'm most passionate about is experiential learning, how we learn by doing um, and many of the ways that you get and can engage with the university are through experiential learning um, that I'll highlight here um, in talking about that. And the thing with experiential learning is that it's always a process. There's always reflection. There's always new change in understanding. And we need to reflect on how we learn in those experiences. So coming with an open mind. So that's a little bit about who I am and what I kind of bring to this. And this is a picture of my family um, <clears throat> and uh, some of the fun things that we like to do together. So just wanted to open up a little bit about myself um, so you knew um, where, where I was coming from um, with today's information. So I, I, I titled this talk, Uncorking University Partnerships um, and Tapping Innovation to Increase Your Capacity. And, and I did that in a way because I was thinking I was like, oh, what, what's the what's the theme? What's the idea here? And, you know, really trying to open that. And I know in my own time, I have been put in situations where I didn't have a wine key to open uh, a bottle of wine and I had to be creative and I had to think of a new way to get into that. So actually, I'd love to engage the group here in, you know, how many different ways have you had to open a bottle of wine? or a bottle, it doesn't have to be wine, a bottle, what are all the different ways that you've done that? So I, I welcome some ideas from the group here. You don't have a wine opener? Breaking the top, that's great. Just just pack it right <laughs> off, That's that works, right? It gets you to the wine, gets uh, you to the liquid in the bottle, what else? A shoe and a screw. A shoe and a screw, okay. So what- Two did separate you instances. 
And then you yeah, it with the, the screw was one thing. And then the shoe, I, I heard from a friend that you, if you just turn it upside down the bottle and just keep hitting on it with a shoe, eventually you can work the cork out. And so I was desperate one time and tried it. So. <laughs> nice. I like that. That's new. I, I, I'm going to take that in my mind in case I'm ever in a situation. And push the cork in with a knife. Yeah, push ideal. the cork in. Yeah. Uh-huh. The saber cut for shampoo. The saber cut, yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I know I saw, I've seen some of those. I don't know if I want to try that. <laughs> well, here's some of the ones. All right, use the screw, the screw, the longer, you know, and hit it with a hammer, kind of pushing it through or pulling it out or push that way in. These are some of the other ones. So the idea, the takeaway here is, oh, and this one, like pump it out. I'm not sure where this how this kind of works, but maybe you could put like a suction um, on it, um, twist it out with keys or serrated knife. So we heard that one. So which way is right? There's no right way. I mean, there's definitely an elegant and you look like a professional way to do it, but there are multiple ways to do things. There are so many different ways. And that is the mindset I think you need to bring to the university, unfortunately, because there is not a front door to walk into. There's not a straightforward way to get. There's not a welcome uh, or a concierge service that will help you at the university. So unfortunately, I have to burst that bubble and I know it's a challenge. Um, and hopefully some more of this information that I can provide can help you figure out how to get in uh, and work with the university because there's lots of great opportunities. All right, so um, I do have a poll question. Uh, Kai, can you put that first poll question? I want to know how are you engaged with the university? How are you familiar with it? Um, and yeah, so look for so that. Poll I am question. so I sorry. I think the way that I set this up, the two questions are going to pop up. We'll see. Oh. I'm. Let's okay. see. I'm so sorry. They both okay. pop up. Just do. Yeah. Just do. We'll just do the first one. I'm here. so sorry about that. Yeah. Okay, so for those of us who uh, are having a hard time taking the poll, how do I, do I just click on it? Yeah, I think so. It should be, did the, um, did a pop-up come up? It mm -hmm. did, yep. And then is there the option to take the, or use the poll? Uh, it, um, it, there, yep, there is, uh, but i Question I'm, two is required, and so you can't submit until you, <sighs> Do uh, question two. I'm so sorry. Oh, okay. okay. No worries. We'll come back. Well, we'll, we'll come back to it or know that because uh, I have some information to provide you before you make that choice. But okay. It's okay. So can I just tell you? Yes. Okay. Yes, like. <laughs> so I went, I graduated from there. Awesome. So it looks like we've got a good kind of spread. We got some folks that work there. They know somebody there. They went to school there. You have attended events there. Someone heard that it had blue turf, which is usually the one thing I run into people when I'm in an airport and they're like, oh, where are you from, Boise? Oh, they, you have the blue turf. Um, so wherever you are, or maybe you choose not to be associated with Boise State, um, I can understand that in, in some context and ways. Um, but hopefully it's just, I, I just wanted to get a sense of where folks were kind of coming from and their familiarity here um, with this. Okay, so I'm gonna end this and then stop sharing. You should see results on your page, but I basically just summarized them um, for you here. So we have a good, a good group. Let's see, how do I think I can relaunch poll? Okay, are you seeing the poll on my screen? Nope. Okay. Well, it's in the middle of my screen. Uh, <laughs> Let's see. Oh. It. Yeah. No. I might have to just work around it. Maybe there's a button. 
Can you, Kai, can you turn off the poll? Can you confirm? Um, it is turned off on my end. Um, if you have that pop-up, um, is there an option for you to minimize the screen? The no. just full screen? I can't, can't move it. This is weird. I haven't had this happen before. I apologize. <laughs> There's technical difficulty. Okay, well, if you don't see it, I'm going to work around it. Yeah, okay, we so yeah. I, I'm, I'm on my I'm on my next slide here. So the front door that I've kind of been talking about. Well, there's a couple things, and there's this enigma of higher ed um, that I've alluded to, and there's a couple key things that hopefully you can kind of begin to understand um, some of the ways that you can get in and begin to access. And so really, there's a key, and the key sometimes is in terminology. Um, in higher ed universities, they like their words and their words mean things and they carry things. And so being familiar with some of the terminology and I'll share some of that here with you today and some of the programs and what some of that means. You know, there's also like what to wear, what do you bring in or wear? And we like to talk about strategic goals and whatever those are. And there's always a new flavor. There's always a new thing that's emerging either from the university on high um, and or the department or a program um, coming in that is supposed to lead and focus our work. So being familiar with that. So for Boise State, we call this the blueprint for success um, uh, that's out there. And those are some of our strategic goals and partnerships are one of them. And they're a piece of that. So being able to leverage that and think about some of those things, I think are important to work with working with any university knowing that there are different spaces on campus, right? Like I said, there's not a front door. There's not just one building. We have dozens, maybe even you know, 30 or 40 different buildings, not only here on the main campus, but sub campuses. There's all different places and there's centers and there's programs and there's courses. There's so many different things and spaces that you can work within. And that's part of the challenge. There are some shortcuts, your network. So I asked earlier, do you know somebody there? Are you related? Are you connected in any way? And sometimes that's the best way. And know when you, you leave this workshop, you'll be connected with myself and I can hopefully provide you some of that connection to some of these programs, whether it's through the program I'm part of or through other programs. And then the tunnel, I call it the tunnel, the research tunnel, it's deep, it's dark um, and you, you have to know where you're going um, with that. And faculty members can be very specific and focused on some of that research. And sometimes they're deep in there and you have to tunnel in a little bit to get in um, and, and connect with them. Um, but there are ways to do that. So those are some of the ways that we can think about that. Okay, let's see, I'm gonna go to, all right. So I've got another poll for you. And my next question was about how you think about partnership um, in that. And so uh, since I don't know if I can relaunch that or is that the second poll? Okay. Oh, where did you go? Oh, here we go. Oh, it moved, excellent. Let's see, no. Oh, it's not on there, okay. So, my question to the group was, how do you think about partnership, knowing uh, either from past experiences or from current experiences, how do you think about partnership? So I'll just open that up to the group since the poll um, isn't, isn't working in that way. Sorry, that was the one I told you that we had to do a chat. <laughs> oh. Okay, so then, so you're saying chat. chat <laughs> Oh. Yes, there we go. <laughs> um, yes, the chat would be the best option for this question. Oh, okay. So enter in the chat. How? What's one word that you you use to describe um, partnership? We get collaboration, everybody wins, people to people. Mutual benefit, learn from each other. Oh, 
right? We think about the process, we think about the outcomes of, of partnerships in which come about that provide value both ways, learning from each other. And these are, so these are some of the great aspects of partnerships that I'm going to hopefully lean on in, uh, in, in, the, in the rest of this talk here today, um, is talking about what that could look like, where that can go. All right, thanks for that engagement here. So I have um, up on your screen right now, you're seeing uh, what is called the enriching collaboration model. So obviously you indicated collaboration is a key part of that. And this comes from strategies and from a book um, by Cress, um, who is one of our scholars in, in the service learning program. And I'll talk a little bit about that in a second. But this is really a model that they found successful in community engaging with universities. And it really starts with exploring the possibilities, what are those, being aware of that. And I'm gonna unpack that and give you some of those opportunities, knowing that there are many more out there. Establishing relationships. So we heard partnerships are about people to people, connecting those folks together. So how do you build relationships? How do you find that commonality? And then where do you engage in faculty, with faculty programs, centers and institutes? There's, like I said earlier, there's so many different spaces that you can engage in. And then primarily you will find yourself working with students and how do you empower those students to be their, their best selves and conduct and meet those expectations in that piece of the partnership. It's not always students, but a large chunk of time you'll find out that these are student related. Um, and then how do you evaluate the impact? What is the impact of that work? And then how do you start again? It's a cycle. Keep reconnecting, finding new opportunities. So know that it's not, and hopefully it's not for you, like you go in and you come out, but it's that you're in and you find these new opportunities and you reconnect. Um, and many of the partners that I'm working with have been with the university for many years because they've continued to find and evolve and grow because each time we've been able to work with them, they've come up with a new impact or a new um, component of their own understanding and the capacity that they have. And it opens up a new possibility to work with another entity on campus. So I'll be hitting and talking about each one of these aspects here. So you've heard me allude or mention service learning. What is service learning? I work in the service learning pro on the program, and I'm the assistant director of community partnerships. So I work with partners, bringing partners in um, to the university and having positive impacts and increasing their capacity. And so service learning is a specific program and strategy that university faculty members use within their classroom. And so service learning is course-based. So it's easily confused with, oh, I'm just volunteering or looking for, you know, somewhere to give my time. Well, it's that and one step further. Students are motivated to learn and to better understand their course content through that. And so we design and help facilitate specific activities. So we scope those out. We identify outcomes and impacts and how it's going to increase your capacity as a community partner. We use and listen to these identified needs. So when community comes and they have these needs and they have these ideas, and that's a really important aspect into us establishing and growing those relationships. And then we're able to gather and have further understanding of the course content. And many times community partners are actually influencing course content. So it works both ways. Not only are students bringing what they learn and helping them better understand it, but you're also influencing how they learn and what they are learning in that. And then around service learning is the sense of civic responsibility um, and engagement in our communities to make them stronger and more resilient. So that's a little bit about what, what service learning is. And in our partnership piece, we really are focusing in on building asset-based partnerships. So that's using your skills, using your capabilities and your resources and highlighting those and making sure that's the core of what we're doing. Listening and making sure that that's part of our active process 
and understanding and asking questions to better understand where those needs lie and where capacity can grow. And then we want our partnership to be mutually beneficial and reciprocal. So like I mentioned, being a co-educator, moving back and forth within there. And we wanna have this growth mindset. So we wanna be able to think about what could it be? How can we change or think of things differently? How, what does the next thing look like? How can this positive change happen in the community? And then we wanna be able to always be thinking about leveraging resources. Those are the things that are on campus, off campus, or with other organizations. Many times in conversations with community partners, I reach out to another organization that has the resources or things that they may not be aware of. So sometimes it's just about connecting in the network and then sustaining them. As I mentioned earlier, in that cycle, how do we keep that cycle going? How do we continue to evolve and grow together um, in that process? Um, and then the final, the final group of them is really these capacity building, being co-educators. And so they're more depth to how our work is guided in that and that they are interdisciplinary and interconnected. I believe that most of the challenges our community faces are not solved by one discipline, but by multiple disciplines, by multiple um, organizations, by a group, and not by one single thing. And so we bring that to our partnerships, and that's how we think about that. Now, I wanted to dive into what service learning was and how we think about this, so you get a deeper sense of that. And as I've alluded to, there are many ways that you can engage with campus whether that's a service learning program like I'm, I'm describing um, right now, but there are also, also other programs and ways to engage that have similar components to the work that they do. So in that chart, in that cycle that I showed, we start off with exploring the possibilities. What are the possibilities? So I've chosen a couple and thrown them up here on the board in a table. And don't worry, this will be a presentation that we can share um, and take a look at and, and dive into more deeply. These are all things that you can easily Google or find those connections, or I can refer you directly to those, those folks in there. So within each one of these opportunities, there are some parameters, and I think it's important to kind of think about those because that might help you scope and think about the work and the ways that you engage um, with different programs on campus. So service learning, I just talked about what that is, course-based, students learning out in the community, but what does that look like in reality? So typically students are um, investing 10 to sometimes 135 hours a semester. So they're very defined by a semester. They're learning focus, as I, I mentioned. And typically, these are first time students in the sense that this is the first time they're going out and doing some of this work. So they're almost brand new into this. Then, and this is in no, no order anyway, in no in, or particular order. Um, there's a little, a little bit of that in the sense of the timeline and scope that I scoped this out here. Internships. Internships are very broad and that can look very different. There's typically not a course associated with it. Students do 10 hours a week and it's typically a semester, but it can be multiple semesters. So there's that. Students are very motivated. This is a potential workplace placement and job skill associated with that, but not all interns and not all programs have the same structure to their internship program. If you work with the College of Business and Education, so those are our business and economics, those students have a very different internship requirement than let's say a communication student. So they're on different scales. So that's something to keep in mind. And they all have different ways that they go about it. So internships in itself is this whole other bucket of ways to engage. One specific program that Boise State has developed is a work you program. And that's really focused on work skills. It's an internship, but there's also a class associated with it. And it's almost a coaching class. And it's how to coach students, how to be active and productive employees in the workforce. And so there's some great opportunities there. So that's very similar to an internship, but obviously has a very specific focus. Another one is Bronco Corps. This is a paid student process and you can request to work with a Bronco Corps student. Most of these students come from the College of Business and Economics. It's about 10 hours a week. It's usually limited to a semester, but there is a limited amount of students associated with that. 
Um, the next one, the Process Improvement Lab, and um, we have uh, Steve on the line here. So feel free to correct me, Steve, if you want to, or if you have a specific question, you can direct message Steve about that. Um, Process Improvement Lab is a relatively new program on campus um, that has been developed to work directly with organizations to identify processes and opportunities to improve their systems. Um, those hours that they're able to work with you vary. It depends on the scope of the project. Um, it can be a semester, it can be a year long or more um, in that. And so the lab really is set up to work with you and customize how they can improve your processes and your workflows and whatever that may be. Um, you are working with experts in that. So these are either fa direct faculty members associated with that and upper level graduate students that are part of that. Some of them are getting paid to do that work. Um, and they work really well with well-defined projects. And Steve has a great process for that. Steve, do you want to add anything more to that since I'm talking about your specific program? Uh, yes, please. Uh, yes. We work with nonprofit organizations with the idea of helping them build capacity. So if you can improve your internal processes that builds capacity in ways that help you better meet mission and serve community. Uh, and with us, you'd be working with a collection of university faculty, graduates from the uh, Boise State's Organizational Performance and Workplace Learning Program, as well as students. Uh, so you'd get a whole community uh, mm -hmm. working with your organization on this. We've worked with the Idaho Food Bank since 2020, pre-COVID. Um, uh, thanks to Mike, we just finished working with the Downtown Boise Association. Awesome. So there are more to these. And like I'm saying, this is kind of like a quick menu, a quick overview. Um, and thank you, Steve, for being here and being able to provide more context for that. Um, next is research. This is similar to orange internships is it looks very different in very different colleges in departments in programs. So there's so many different ways that this can look. So it's very, it's variable on how you engage faculty members with research. It could be multiple years. Um, typically. Um, so it's a bigger commitment. You are working obviously with experts. These are probably most likely direct faculty members, sometimes graduate students, also sometimes students to uh, undergraduate students as well. Um, but in order to kind of work on that needing kind of a research based question and kind of the development of that is really um, important in starting to kind of connect with that. And like I mentioned in the very beginning, research is is a tough one to kind of tap into. Um, and it really sometimes is the product of some of these earlier relationships that I talked about on this list, either through service learning or internships or the process improvement lab um, or Bronco core or things like that, that then lead to research too. It's a hard first step. Then there's the Idaho po uh, Policy Institute. Um, they are a program or an institute on campus that does high level policy research and data collection. They, um, they work with multiple nonprofits. Um, and then they also do the work of the legislature and the, our, our government too as well to get information to help them make better decisions. Um, they are experts and they have a staff of research associates that work on certain projects. Um, they do have a capacity on how many projects they can take and they take on big things. They do not take on data projects that are associated with advocacy though, due to the nature of the work that they do. Um, but they have worked on projects that are around better understanding um, the housing market and homelessness in the Valley and across the state, um, as well as things like educational level and things like that. So overarching stats and information that can be help, helpful um, in the work that you do. Um, another one that's similar to Bronco Core is work study. Um, our service learning program, we also work within community work study, and that allows students to go and use their work study funds out in, uh, in the community. Um, there's a limited number of those positions. And so these are, this is funding that students receive through their financial aid. And then they're able to take that and basically earn that money by working and meeting a need out in the community. And so there's opportunities there 
right now we're at capacity and some of those open up. Um, but just another one, sometimes it's right place, right time to try to find those opportunities or find the right student who has a work study award. Um, there's about <clears throat> 300 students on campus that have it. Um, so not a lot sometimes, and we don't know who they are. It's a needle in the haystack. So it's a lot of recruitment, but we do have some partners that have been successful in identifying some students and working with them. And that can last for more of a year. Um, they don't really do HR kind of management type of thing. Um, they really are better at um, <clears throat> other capacity related programs or projects that currently exist and stepping in in those roles too. And then the last one is VIP and VIP stands for vertically integrated um, projects. And that is also very, it's variable. And these are faculty directed projects where they work with students from freshman, sophomore, junior, senior, and graduate students to work on a specific topic or focus area. And there are very various different models of this. And these are primarily run out of the College of Innovation and Design um, that um, create the space for faculty to design these experiences so students get multiple opportunities to work on a project at different levels. And some of those are very community focused. One of them is um, Book in Every Home, and they work with various community partners, gathering books, understanding literacy, and getting books out into homes in the community. Um, so it's more than just a book drive, and there's multiple levels to the work that they're doing and how students understand how to make an impact on literacy in our community and what that can look like. Um, and so these are just a couple. There are more. Um, so if you're like, oh, well, I heard about this program and this program, I acknowledge that I don't have everything here on the list. These are the most common ones that I've seen partners find them way, find a way to connect with the university. All right, so I'm going to pause there and see if there's any, any questions. And then if you recall, I had a poll question um, about which one of these seems like it might align best with what you would want to leverage from the university. I'll just say that we've uh, tapped BSU very, very um, for a lot of things and have had great experiences so anyone out there that is looking to try to um, work the innovation cycles in their work, uh, BSU has really come through over and over. Thanks, Blossom. Yeah, there, there's a, as you just put in the chat, I just saw there's lots of ways to connect. And that's just kind of an example, as I was talking about before, is kind of exploring, finding these, building relationships, keep cycling around. There are so many different ways um, to engage in that way. So any questions about any of these programs or one that's particularly interesting for you and the work that you do? I was looking through an, a number of the different opportunities. And it sounds like in some cases, it may be good to have like a well-defined need or, or project before approaching. Mm -hmm. it. Yes. Yeah, it's, it, it's, it's really important to have at least a good sense of what you're hoping to accomplish, mm -hmm. where your need is, where capacity could be increased. Um, for most of these, um, these programs. And I'll talk a little bit about that here, about how to kind of prepare, how to think about some of these. So this is really kind of the first phase is kind of exploring these, um, knowing a little bit about what's out there because there is not one place that you can go to on our website that would list out all of these things. Uh, interesting enough, if you go to Boise State just partnership, you'll end up finding yourself um, more on an advancement type of side or business partnerships um, that are more financially associated than either service or impact capacity focused. Um, so hence why this uh, I'm sharing this information here with you now. 
So Mike and Steve, quick question. Is the Process mm -hmm. Improvement Lab and the um, Office for Performance and Workforce Learning, are they one in the same or how do, what, what's the relationship? I'm part of the uh, department called Organizational Performance and Workplace Learning. We call it OPAL because Idaho is the gem state. Uh, OPAL has several research labs and one of them is the process management lab. And the process management lab uh, is something that Rob Anson, who's professor emeritus from IT and supply chain management, and I came uh, up with as a way to uh, benefit nonprofit organizations and our students and graduates in the community. It's a great, great question. I know there's there's so many different different acronyms and words out there around the university that they can be an alphabet soup or hard to kind of associate and decode. And that's what I mentioned. As I mentioned earlier, some of the terminology can be important and always asking those questions um, helps us uh, acknowledge those those challenges we create. Um, all right. So. One of the components here is developing these relationships once you've found these things. And definitely they are something that takes some time. And how do you build this reciprocal piece? And so here are some kind of quick kind of takeaways to kind of think about is, you know, founded on shared values in the sense of like, what do you want to accomplish in this partnership, in this connection? Um, within that. And so within those values and ways that you can approach this work, um, having that commonality is a great foundation. Obviously, the work should benefit both, as we've heard earlier when folks were sharing how, what should a partnership look like? And then also, you know, this interpersonal relationship, do you have them? I've seen partnerships fall apart because they happen via email. One and two, you can have, you know, you can pretty much get to in an email, but do you have the interpersonal relationship? Have you got to know the individuals that you're working with? Do you know something about them? Then is it multidimensional? As I was alluding to earlier, some of our most successful partnerships are working with multiple entities on campus. They're working in different disciplines and it becomes more uh, robust and it is solidified in moving forward. Then having this organized process as you get more comfortable working with uh, an entity on campus that you have an organization to it, that it is integrated in your work. I've also seen partnerships where it's like, oh yeah, you know, we have service learning students and they're over there and they're doing that. And yes, it's helping us out and it's great. And they come from multiple disciplines and they're great people and things like that, but it's not tied into some of the other work that's going on at the organization. And so sometimes it just seems like it's this thing going on over here. And sometimes that has impacts um, on the students and the faculty members in the long term. So how do you integrate that? How's that part of that? I know that some organizations do include service learning students and interns in their regular staff meetings. They're integrated. They get to see the whole functioning and they get to see how their role is played in that. That we find a way to sustain these partnerships and do that. Like, how are we gonna continue to do that? And sometimes that involves looking for funding. I know, right? Funding helps sustain things in the long run. So looking in that direction is really helpful. And then do you evaluate? Do you take a look at these impacts? Are you able to report on those things and share those? Um, because those are the stories that then either bring in more folks and highlight and celebrate. Everybody loves to see themselves acknowledged on social media or in a news article. And it highlights that kind of program and shares that impact. And then people want to work with you and it expands that. So that's how you can think about the relationship component of this kind of cycle. Next, thinking about how you engage with faculty program centers and institutes. Know that things are different. Faculty have different work-life balance. 
the work and the focus for faculty, most faculty members are driven by their research around the focus in order for them to continue their employment and continue into tenure, they have to research, they have to publish. Some of them have to engage with community and they have to balance that and they have to think about that as well as their teaching load. So there are multiple things and that can be very different than your work environment and how you balance things compared to at a university. Faculty members, students, they want to co-create content. So engaging them in that learning and in that development is something that it motivates individuals here. Now, the one that most folks don't wanna think about or how they're gonna engage, um, see Steve, um, is an agreement, an MOU, an MOA. That covers the risk and the liabilities. You can expect to see that in majority of these relationships in some, some level or another. Um, so keep that in mind, depending on what students will work on. If you have students working on trails, like you saw in the previous picture, um, that uh, yes, it was Halls Gulch area, and they were working with the Treasure Valley Land Trust, students were out there doing some trail work, um, then they, we need to think about how to mitigate those things. But if they're working on a marketing plan for you or the interns working in your office, things may look very different. So think about that kind of scale and expect that. Also expect that you're gonna meet regularly with faculty and students. It's very rare that you are able to, uh, to work with a partner and drop something off and then come back and pick it up like Kinko's um, or like the FedEx Copy Center. You're gonna to need to engage, you're gonna to need to meet, you're gonna to need to make sure that your expectations are met in that way. Um, so being aware of that, you're gonna be able to, you're gonna to need to kind of balance that and kind of figure that out. And then also be able to provide resources. I've heard this over and over again from both sides, partners and programs, that it is challenging to get all of the things that they need and always asking that. So make sure that you are able to access some of that information, or if that's going to limit your accessibility, then think about a project differently, especially if there's sensitive information associated with that. And I know organizations or programs like the Idaho uh, Policy Institute, they're really great at working with sensitive information because they do some of this big data collection and, and analysis too as well. So those are some things to expect in, when you engage with um, faculty programs. Now, I also mentioned empowering students. How do you create an inclusive space you know, for students to succeed? So they wanna be part of it. So they're sharing with you um, in being part of that. So think about your space. Your space is most likely very different than the classroom or the university that they're used to working on. So how do you bridge that gap? How do you make that part of it? And asking students what they need to be successful. And so orienting them to your culture. And that might be one way of onboarding them and bringing them in. Having space and dialogue, if that's not part of your culture, that might be something you need to create then for the students that you're working with so that information can be shared, can, feedback can be provided in that team. Think about this as a new team that you're working with and you really wanna spend the time to get to know those individuals. Think about whether you have different policies for your volunteers or folks that are coming into your organization than the rest of your organization. I have seen that occur before within a program where they had certain policies and different ones for that. And then folks start to realize, oh wait, this is different for these different areas, whether that's access to you know, coffee or not um, in the break room um, or who can use the break room. Oops, sorry, I hit the wrong button. Um, and then does your organization acknowledge and welcome different identities? And this is something that students are particularly aware of when they come into a new space. How do you use words within your organization? How do you acknowledge different identities? Are they welcome in that space? 
working with students is going to be very different in the sense that you might not be bringing them on like an employee that you know a lot about for the very first time. It may be that you're bringing in a student and you may not know everything about that student or about their lived experience due to that time that you have. So how are you creating a welcoming experience that is going to work with them and provide flexibility um, within the project work um, as well as having them have a voice. They want to engage with you as an organization. So think about how your space is welcoming to all identities. And where, as I've mentioned, we're, will students get to share feedback? Will they get to offer up ideas? Um, and like I said earlier, where an organization integrated those students into their staff meeting, students were more excited and they were more willing to share new ideas or new ways to do things. And that has helped this organization stay innovative and evolve with the changing culture and society and climate that has emerged in the last year during the pandemic. And that has been a great way that they've empowered students to be part of that organization. All right, so also working with students thinking about, and I just want to reiterate some of these things is this idealism. Students come in, they're very excited. They have new ideas. Some of them make sense and some of them don't. Know that students are going to come in in that way. They also have a different perception of time. Um, and that is something to clarify in your expectations while working with students is what is your perception of time? How does your organization function? And I've seen varying levels of that. They also come in with some assumptions, and that's why orienting students and having conversations and asking them what they know and understand from the beginning is going to help you address some of the assumptions that are incorrect. Students are also going to have a path of least resistance that they're looking for. They're juggling a lot, so things need to be manageable to them, and they're going to have a priority level to those things too as well. I know some of this doesn't sound like the greatest, but um, these are pretty um, uh, real things to expect and not from all students. And some of these can be leveraged to your advantage, but they can also hinder the work. Um, so think about how to use these and consider these while working with students. And lastly, evaluate and think about this. How are you gonna create assessment met met methods for the work and the outcome? I've worked with many partners that are like, yes, we just want students to come in and we want them to do things and they've done things and then they leave. And we're like, what impact did they have? And so one of the questions was asked earlier, so we need to have a great plan or goal or idea or something we wanna accomplish. Yes, that's essential in the beginning because then you clearly know what you're going to evaluate. What is gonna change is, in it, you know, students coming into the school and they're on a lunch buddies, you know, hanging out on the playground. What is the impact those students had over the course of this semester, or this year? How are these books getting into the community and is literacy rates increasing from that? Finding those measures are ways that then you can share and celebrate and reflect on what worked and what didn't work in those partnerships. All right, so that's pretty much a lot of this model and how you can think about really engaging with the university. This is what it's gonna look like in some way or another with each one of those programs that I highlighted for you here. And you know, as they say, <laughs> rinse and repeat, start again, take a new look, bring, engage with a new, one, a new program or entity because they're gonna bring you a whole new dimension of the work that you can accomplish to increase your capacity. So I'll pause there here as we're getting towards the end of time. And I wanted to kind of take some, take some questions here that you may have um, about how to engage with the university, how to really find the door and what to expect. Thank you so much, Mike, for that presentation. Um, I have a question. Mm -hmm. Do you folks help students, um, so like once they complete an internship or they're doing service learning or working with another organization, do you help them um, use their experience or like take their experience and then help them like market themselves based mm -hmm. off of 
the work that they did, like showing them how to put it onto their resume, incorporating it into their cover letter so that mm -hmm. they become more marketable based off of their experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in fact, so our career center on campus does exactly that. And they have workshops associated with that. And in a way, that's how they created the Work You program. So one of the ones that I listed here, they wanted to create that space so that they could create and have opportunities for students and then help students articulate what they learned and make themselves more marketable and leverage those experience. And that's how that, that leveraging those students is very focused on building those workplace skills. And then they have classroom time to articulate those. Yeah. So yeah, that just another program connection. There is this whole support around students in trying to make them as successful as possible after they graduate. Hey, Mike, would you talk about how your uh, service learning, how the different programs are actually evaluating um, mm -hmm. their what they're doing? Yeah. So each so for service learning, so ours are all course based. <clears throat> And so we evaluate students in multiple ways. One of the ways that we evaluate the impact is on students learning. And so at the end of the semester, every student has an evaluation about their course. So they're gonna ask all these basic things. And we have some service learning focused questions. And one of our big focuses is how impactful has service learning been on your learning and understanding? So, right, in a broad sense, as we look at that and, you know, well above 60% of students have a better understanding of their, of their course content because of service learning. So that's one way. We also say, does it help you um, find your career path um, in that? And the majority of students are, are saying that and wanting to see service learning in more of their classes because they enjoy that. So we're evaluating the impact of the, that teaching process. Then for many of the projects that we do work on that we help manage with faculty members, we have ways that students are reflecting and submitting their what we call impacts. And that's the hour and the focus and how they are focusing their time. And we use UN sustainability development goals in order to categorize those impacts on where students are having impacts in the community in those different categories and working towards that. Then we can share those with a community partner and allow them to articulate to potential donors or fundraisers on what service learning students can accomplish or where they might have additional need and need additional capacity to work around things um, that are around food insecurity, for instance, um, you know, where students are focusing on that at a food pantry or something like that in the community. So we provide all different ways within service learning to measure and articulate what that impact is. And some of it has to be very customized within the projects that they do. So, yeah, thanks for asking that question. Obviously, there's so much to, to talk about, and I wanted to hit everything at a broad level. Mike, this is Kimbra. This was great information. And my experience with working with the interns particularly um, is really needing to put the time and effort into helping them do well. I love mm -hmm. that you said that yeah. over and over again, but it extends also to the reporting that needs to be done at the end of their time. And I mean, we are, we are in such an incredible place to be able to influence their impact and their vision on the world. I just wanted to reiterate that because yeah. that was kind of an aha to me the first time I saw the intensity of yeah. the paperwork that went with it, but what an opportunity. That was really cool. Yeah, and it can vary based on these programs. That's something else I didn't talk about is like, yeah, what does reporting look like? What is um, evaluating even the student's performance and also preparing for that? And that's a real something that I want to emphasize as you begin to work is asking those questions at the very beginning of your kind of partnership or whatever program is like, okay, is this something that is going to increase my capacity? Do I have the time to devote and will this lead to the increase in my capacity? I have talked to partners in the past where I've been like, I don't think this is going to really increase your capacity here because of the amount of work that it's going to take. Let's try to find a different option for you. You know, maybe you need a more longer term project, or maybe we need an intermediary project that will help build the foundations for the students to do this. 
And let's talk about one of these other programs that I mentioned here today that might help you do that. So coming in, being aware of what that is for you and what capacity you have, because it will take time. So I'm glad, Kimber, that was part of your kind of takeaway is like, okay, this does take some time. We do need to consider that. And, 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 and that is really important to success or else we do get partners who do get burned out or it's like, okay, wait, why are we doing this? Is this really important for us to continue to, to work on? Or do we need to rethink that? And we are here as partners to do that and rethink about that. Um, I'm not on a quota basis. Majority of these programs are not. So we're not going to drive you into it just so we can count you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, just for the sake of time, we're going to be wrapping it up. And once again, thank you so much, Mike, for your time and for your presentation. And thank you all for joining today.